welcome to a very special episode of The Witching Hour. We are presenting for North Bend Film Fest with the uh, director and cast of Superior. I am so delighted to be joined by director Aaron Vasilopoulos and stars Alessandra and Ani Mesa. Thank you guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much for having us. Absolutely. And so I wanted to tee up the film a little bit for our listeners who may not have attended the festival, but I also don't know how much you don't want to give away. So if, if one of you would give me your preferred synopsis, that would be great. Yeah, so I usually describe the film Superior as a sort of thriller drama hybrid um, about identical twin sisters who reconnect when one sister returns to their hometown um, on the run to hide out. I've seen it. I really liked it. It's a beautiful movie. I want to definitely dive into the uh, you know, cinematography element of it in a bit, but we do always kind of like to go back to the beginning a little bit uh, on The Witching Hour. And I want to talk to all of you about that, but for Alessandra and Annie, it is not, let's say, super common for even siblings, but twins to want to get into the same industry of acting. And um, I'm curious, what age did you guys realize you both wanted to do that? And how did that come about for you? We started doing uh, theater together late in high school. And we, I think both became really obsessed with it and never wanted to leave the theater. Um, and I think we both kind of uh, held on to different aspects that we have carried into our adulthood. I think like my sister loves being in process with different people and collaborating and um, and I do as well, but I've also been, you know, very focused on like the acting element. So we, we kind of have like a, a certain balance between the two of us that we're like, we're doing the same thing, but we have a kind of uh, yin and yang together. Um, but yeah, just at the end of high school. Did you find that both of you wanting to partake in it only further fueled that interest in the art of acting? Yeah, I think just being able to talk, we became obsessed with it. I, at first, it, it, it actually first started out technically in eighth grade because my cousin was afraid to go to her summer camp alone. And so she convinced us the night before her summer camp to go to camp with her. And it was like this, theater camp. And we didn't really have a specific interest in theater. We just were like, yeah, we'll go with you. And we I just from that just completely loved it, kept doing it as often as we could and then started getting more into film. And I think I think that once we started getting more into film and, and watching movies, we became very obsessed. And um, that's became kind of all we would talk about at that point. But yeah, we feel we were feeling each other for sure. And for you, Erin, when did you like first discover that passion? I don't know if it was a particular film you saw that made you realize you want to do that. And at what point did you decide to like pursue that more professionally and go all the way to grad school? Yeah, um, it was a bit of a roundabout process for me. I was a bit older um, when I finally decided to go to film school. Um, it's not like I grew up knowing that I wanted to be a filmmaker or anything like that. Um, and I think eventually what it was for me was just like getting a camera. Like I, I was always obsessed with film and like watched tons of movies growing up and through college. And I was sort of on a path to wanting to like curate film, something like in a museum setting or something like that. And then I, I ended up moving to Spain for a couple of years was living in Madrid teaching um, for a couple of years and got a little camera over there. And that was the first time I actually started like shooting stuff and starting to edit and like pairing stuff with music. And um, I do think in a lot of ways, those experiences eventually like combined with my sort of longstanding interest in film, that was enough to like convince me that I should apply to film school and that this, it sort of really felt like something that combined a range of my interests also in writing and um, sort of like visual art, design, um, just felt like all those things kind of came together in filmmaking and inspired me to apply to film school and, and go to film school. And so 
correct me if this is wrong. I believe that you all attended NYU and this came about as a project at NYU, correct? Yes. Excellent. So <laughs> it, it, we often ask like the follow-up of what did film school give you or was it worth it and what was, what did you get from it? It's very obvious here that this like going to graduate school directly led you guys to this project. But I, I'm curious outside of that, what did each of you take from that education experience and you know whether it's it's networking or the way you approach your art was there something bigger and grander than the obvious it led us here today very specifically my sister and i both studied acting in school for me it was like a time of discovery for me just to figure out who i was as an artist and meeting a lot of my people and a lot of the artists that I still work with today, including Aaron. Um, and yeah, for, for me, the huge, huge benefit of, of going to school was just uh, the, the people that I met and the teachers that I was able to have that changed the way I saw art. You know, being in New York City is one of my favorite parts of having gone to NYU is just like the amount of characters that you meet along the way and you can like bring it into your work. It's just such a global city. Um, and yeah, the community, I'm, I'm, I am such a fan of uh, creating an ensemble of people that you continue to work with. And uh, I think just having a, a group of, you know, like-minded people around at NYU, just you, you gravitate towards certain people and some people you want to hold on to and you know, I'm, I'm grateful to have found a few, so. It's definitely community. Like it's definitely the collaborators that I met in, in film school. And um, like our DP is, we actually ended up working together on our very first student short in grad school. And then she shot the short film and eventually the feature and we still work together. And um, but yeah, definitely like the people that I met, not just in my class, but like in the years sort of ahead and below me and um, there's still like a lot of crossover with people I'm meeting today and reaching out to today. And um, I think that was definitely like. In terms of those relationships that you built, obviously this is a very functional and thriving creative dynamic you've built with each other. Um, and from your perspective, Erin, I believe you, you wrote the short film Superior without having met them. And then you came back to write the feature and you co-wrote it with Alessandra. So I'm curious from your perspective, the, uh, you know, approaching the same characters first from having not known your stars and then kind of building up again from not just knowing them, but having one on board writing. Them. There was quite a big time jump between the two, um, but it did feel quite different. Um, and I think we were exploring, we're exploring like a little bit different things in, in the feature superior. I mean, the themes carry over, but I think with the short, it was really about sort of like the growing pains between teenage identical twins and sort of specifically the moment one sister is wanting to distinguish herself. Um, there's a lot, I think a little more like tension and I think the performance style is also like slightly different. Um, so like, I don't know, but um, it definitely like informed our jumping off point to a large degree when Ali and I got together and started talking about the possibility of a feature and, and outlining. Um, and yeah, we were mostly just excited to sort of like fill in that backstory of, we, we loved the idea of creating this jump in time so that the feature picks up six years later. Um, and yeah, the short was definitely like an interesting prologue to be able to like use as a sort of jumping off point um, for that process. But we also, I think, gave ourselves room to sort of like experiment and open it up to something new. And I think especially like the thriller elements of the feature feel quite different to me. Um, and that's, yeah, that was a big part of the writing process, so. And then I'll let these two speak to the fact that like their relationship also informs a lot of, I think, the script and um, 
there's some specific instances of that. And then, but I think just more broadly, um, Ali had a lot to bring to the table and with the feature um, being a twin herself, obviously. It feels kind of like a, a natural thing to bring to the table, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think um, with the feature, you know, we, we started writing it and like within, within the first day we had like a full outline of what, what kind of the direction that we wanted to take. And we had first decided to meet to write something. We didn't even, we weren't specifically thinking that we were gonna do a continuation of the short. That was never something that was brought up or thought of, or it, it was kind of like open-ended and, and it just immediately became all about this. And um, we pretty much knew where it was going from the start, which I think is really special. You also had the opportunity to return to, as you say, evolved in a different angle on, but characters you had previously, previously established a few years later, which you really usually only see like in franchise filmmaking. So um, how, how is that for you guys as performers? And did your sort of relationships to your characters also change over that time? Yeah, that was really, really special um, as, as, a, as a writer to do that with a character that already like existed and that I'd been able to play and also as an actor. Yeah, it was, it was a really amazing experience and, and the characters change a lot between the two films. Um, but it's always nice as an actor to have that like, kind of built-in backstory, because that's kind of part of your work anyway. So yeah, it was really nice to have. Uh, I think Erin put it really well when she said it was like a jumping off point. I think like having the foundation and the backstory allowed for more, getting more imaginative when it came to like the characters and how they've evolved and, you know, kind of like being able to paint kind of like broader pictures uh, of these characters. Um, and we, I think we just, we had a lot of fun with the characterization of them. Uh, I think you guys did too in the, in the writing of it and that, that was just like on the page. Um, but I think that, that there's also a certain level of uh, comfort and just an ability to communicate directly between the three of us that we were also able to um, develop. So by the time the feature came around, we were, you know, making kind of braver, choices and, and, and feeling more like, you know, uh, comfortable in the creative process. Yeah, I do think having, just to add one more thing, having the short, it was definitely sort of, I think we were all just so excited about that whole world too and the characters and um, it definitely helped serve as sort of like a foundation throughout the whole process of making the feature um, to have that to draw on. I think that, um... Erin, you've spoken about that your original idea for the short had had come from growing up around twins. And I think you guys probably know from firsthand experience, there is, in fact, a lot of fascination around twins. Um, was that an interesting thing for you guys to explore and have, you know, like guardianship over in a feature film? I, I mean, I don't I don't have to tell you it can be exploitative and weird. And so like, uh, was that empowering in some way? I remember the first, I, I remember when I first read the short thinking how awesome it was that there was a project about twins where we weren't like in a circus or like very like fetishized or yeah, it was, it was amazing. And, and that's, that's been a special part about this project all along. Um, but I, I remember distinctly having that feeling like, like we had found like a diamond in the rough with this project when we were working on the short. Yeah, I also feel like, you know, just because we're twins, we just think like, you know, twins are people like anyone else. Like, I think if we were characterizing them just as sisters, we would have kind of given them the same. I think we focused, you know, on giving them like their individuality and. Care. And I think that's um, maybe from like our own struggle and our own quest for individuality. Um, yeah, so I think that that informed a lot of it and a lot of the themes of the movie being about identity, independence. This is highly tied into identity and and the, you know, the differences and shared ground between these characters and, uh, you know, eventually sort of 
transmuting those things into your performances at a certain point. Uh, how do you approach playing your twin sister who is playing a character? Like that seems like a little bit of a, a head bop maybe? Like, how did you get into exchanging those personas while you're also working within your own lived experiences? Uh, I, it was definitely a mindfuck. I think um, in, in a lot of ways, it's uh, not only did we have to distinguish, I wanted to make sure that we distinguish, but we all did want to distinguish between the two characters, but also there are certain elements um, in the characters that are like very different from who we are naturally. So there was like a lot of navigating to do. And we knew that the switch was coming up in the movie. So we wanted to make sure that they were, you know, distinct enough that that could be like pulled off without being confusing or anything like that's for me that's where part of my focus was yeah for me the the switching um felt was was a was wasn't very it was it was a very kind of when because i had as marion been spending time with vivian on set and getting to know this character that my sister had built through my character when the switch came, it was kind of like, I, I think at first I was like, you know, in my head, like, oh, oh no, like this, this, this might be really tough. You know, I was, I was nervous about, about that element of it. But then at one point I realized, you know, Marion is not a professional actor and she just trying to be as much like her sister as possible. So that's, that kind of calmed me down and, and also, I think, I think helped because I think at one point I was trying to like make it such a perfect like impression. And I was like, that's not really realistic, <laughs> you know? And so then after I had that like little breakthrough, then it all became kind of easier. It became more of like a, a game for, for Marion. That's such a good point. And I have to say, I was really nervous about that aspect of the story too. But like, I also think just the tone of the world like allowed for that in a way. You did such a good job of like walking this line between it being kind of comical and still ground, like grounded enough, I think, um, where it works. But um, yeah, no, you guys nailed it. And like, I think that's totally right. Marion's she wouldn't have been like a seamless, totally seamless performer. And part of what I love about your performances is like seeing that, seeing your interpretation of that. Something else I really love about kind of what you're talking about, the the overlapping of more comedic elements and there is the, the thriller baseline, but also somehow while satisfying all those things, you guys make time for really quiet character beats like I think about the moment with the ice cream and stuff like that um what is what is the deciding factor whether it's when you're writing it or in the edit of why something like that stays more commercial films often don't take that time for really quiet small character beats and is there ever an impulse to think well maybe it's more marketable if we if we streamline and keep it straight thriller yeah, no, I'm glad you're bringing this up because it is, I think a big part of the story is like these different tones. And um, I think that we had a lot of fun with that when we were writing and definitely wanted it to be this sort of very much like hybrid of, of genres. Um, so yeah, a lot of that came, I think, in writing, but then in, in editing, I will say it was like a little bit of a challenge to then sort of make sure we were balancing all of the tones um because they do swing quite a bit like between the comical and then like the especially thriller elements but um yeah the our editor Jen Ruff was really instrumental in sort of figuring that out and using sound and music to sort of help create like a more cohesive palette for everything um it was to a large degree how the opening of the film sort of evolved the way it did with the inner cutting that was something that really came in in the edit and feeling like we needed to sort of establish these two worlds of each sister, the sort of thriller through line that Marion was coming from and then the do like domestic sort of slightly more comedic stilted 
um, tone of, of Vivian's world. Um, we didn't have those two things in our cup quite as much in the opening of the, of the script as written. Um, what was your other, oh, was that how intentional were, yeah, I don't know. I don't think, I think a lot of that was just intuitive, Ali, as we were writing. Um, yeah, I think that, I think that you naturally as a director are okay with taking your time and um, setting a very specific pace um, that I think that is like natural within you, um, which I think is beautiful. And, um, but yeah, as far as, as the tones, that was something we were very aware of when we were writing you know, like these, these two very different worlds that eventually were going to collide. Like we had to start out at like very, very different, different places and kind of be like, how, how are these going to tie in to get what's going to happen? Here? You know, that was, that was definitely part of it. From, from my perspective, I also felt like part of that came from the combination of year two writing styles. I mean, I, I don't know if that's like, yeah, I, it, it was intentional, but it's also, you know, it's, two different minds coming together and and like there was a there was a clear like a and and it it also even it lived within the characters too that same duality they they're coming from different worlds that are you know and they've been separate for 7 years and now, are now coming together so there's that that natural ebb and flow between the two so as I promised, I'm going to have to talk about the cinematography a bit because it is a beautiful looking movie. Um, how do you convince producers to let you shoot on 16 millimeter? Oh my gosh, that's a good question. <laughs> Honestly, I got so lucky with that, um, with this project. Um, I really didn't, I just like didn't know if it was going to be possible um, because it is so expensive and it's just like the process takes so much more time. Um, but yeah, they honestly, I have to say, were pretty much on board right away with that idea because they just saw the short and like sort of reading the feature through the lens of the short, they were like, we, you know, we see that this needs to be a continuation. We want this to feel like a continuation of that world. And then also the fact that um, we decided to set the feature um, in the 80s like specifically in the 80s, I think everybody agreed that film would really help um, help us just sort of build that feeling um, without having like a huge budget for like production design and um, that the film would really like um, just lend itself to a sort of 80s quality, vintage quality. Um, so yeah, just really lucky with our producers kind of getting all of that from the beginning. I have to say I was even more impressed knowing that it was shot on film, like even more impressed by the commitment to taking time for smaller moments, knowing that each one of those moments was literally burning film. Like you can't just shoot infinite, right? Like you can't. Yeah. That was such a wild experience too, as an actor to like be shooting on film and know that like once everything goes right, you have like one or two takes, you know, because it's, you know, it was a low budget environment, but also we're shooting on film and, you know, things are, I, yeah. There's like a- hard for you, for the actors. Cause it's like, you just get sort of put into this, like, it just creates a little more like rigidity. Um, and I mean, I think that's helpful sometimes. I feel like it sort of elevates the experience, but it's also like a little bit higher stakes. And, I, I personally love the adrenaline of it. So to me, it was like, there was a certain like immediacy and an adrenaline that gave me a lot. And I, I, I loved it. I imagine you guys weren't doing a lot of riffing. <laughs> <laughs> there was some improv in some little moments, but no, for the most part, we were sticking to the script. I would say that if there were, if there was any riffing done, it was in the ice cream shop. You opted to set it in the 80s in part for, you know, the sort of aesthetic and tone. But once you made that decision, did you find that it influenced the narrative and storytelling in specific ways? There were like a lot of reasons, I think, why we gravitated towards the 80s, partially because the short already kind of had that feel. It wasn't specifically 80s, but it sort of felt like it or like kind of an any time, any place kind of aesthetic. But I mean, I do remember when we were first talking about the feature, like 
I just always like being able to write um, sort of like miscommunications and sort of like mixed messages across paths. And like, this is just so much harder to do with like modern technology. Um, yeah. It's kind of a boring detail, but like, I do think that was sort of like when we were writing, it allowed us to just like have a lot more sort of like misunderstandings and mix ups between characters. Yeah, and these characters are so disconnected for so long, and I don't think that would happen in the same way today. No. Yeah, I was thinking about that as well. Like, you may not have spoken for several years, but you probably know what was up. For me personally, like, the seclusion, like, the small town feel, like, it helped build, like, the kind of, like, mundaneness of, of every life, and also, like, yeah, the, the complete mystery of what's been going on with my sister, and and even help, like Aaron said, like, building the tension, um, throughout the story and, and allowing for miscommunications, mishaps, and not everything's just like a quick text away would solve as a quick text and, oh, that's, we solved the problem, <laughs> nowhere to go now. I think that's a really good point, but that, yeah, without that, the characters are much more like isolated and yeah, that's definitely a big part of the story. Erin, you spoke about how you reworked the intro a little bit to combine like the feelings of those two different worlds. And I'm curious, how you worked with your DP, Mia Chaffee, is that right? Okay, Mia Chaffee. Nice. Yeah. Um, to, to establish those different worlds and then ultimately how you reframed it as the film moved on to sort of blend them more together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was definitely a big challenge. Um, and I think we just, we had like pretty different references for each sort of thread, the thriller thread and the drama and sort of the domestic sphere. Um, I think for like Marion's story, we knew that we wanted that to feel a little bit more like noirish and like we kind of were looking at some like Jalo horror stuff, um, references. So we wanted that to feel a lot more, even like even the whole film is pretty heightened, but we wanted that to feel sort of even more heightened and stylized. Um, and I think like more shadowy, like we used a little bit like harsher lighting, more contrast. Um, and then in the house, <laughs> we, we went pretty crazy with like colors <laughs> in the house. Um, that became a big part of like sort of that tone. Um, and I think, I, I think afterwards people have pointed out like a comparison to like um, all the Almodovar, which like I hadn't been thinking about, but like now I see that and I'm like, that's pretty interesting. And I, I like that connection. Um, all the, I don't know, the colors almost like add to the sort of like confinement of Vivian's world. And it's like a little bit deranged, the whole, <laughs> the whole thing. I think that palette, the greens and like reds that we, that we had in the house. Um, but also, yeah, in terms of shooting, we also talked a lot about like um, having more static shots in the house, wanting the house to feel kind of, again, like, like characters were kind of stuck there and a little bit stifled. Whereas um, with Marion's through line and like, especially Robert starting to show up in the house, we decided to go a little more handheld and like try to create sort of ruptures in that stillness. Um, so we were often thinking about ways that um, those moments would sort of break into the stillness of the house and sort of the stability of the house. Or... Another benefit of the 80s and your commitment to bright stylized color are the stunning costumes. Um, <laughs> they are so, especially anything you guys wear that's red is like, I would, I would wear that, it's beautiful. Well, I am curious about the, the heavy use of red. Does that make things more challenging to feature so much red in a, a shot? I know that's kind of a goofy, really fundamental rudimentary question, but it's a really bold, punchy colors and there's a lot of them in the costuming. Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. I think Mia would have like more <laughs> opinions on that. I do remember she was like, she was a little nervous about the green walls in the house and red, like combining that with red, um, I think for like skin tones. But 
In general, I think red shows up pretty well on film. Actually, I think digitally it can be a little trickier. Um, I don't know that for sure, but I, I just feel like it, like when you compress things, like red can start to get kind of crunchy digitally, but like, I don't know, in my experience, I'm obsessed with the red and it was a big part of the short and um, I don't know, I always love the way it looks on film. Um, I can't think of any other scenes where it felt like a challenge specifically, but. Maybe that is why it's so striking to me because it, red is not an uncommon color for clothing, but it is so striking in this movie. So maybe it's it is not filming. Yeah. 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 I feel like in, in this movie, there's, um, when, when red is used, there's usually like some kind of danger or, or like a, uh, for, for me, like Vivian's red dress is like, she's like pursuing her passion and it leads her into danger. And I, I, I don't know, I feel like uh, the red jumpsuit in the beginning too is like, you're just like automatically, you're like something's, something's the, you know, something's, there's some danger in the air. Um, and I, I felt that way when I was, when I was wearing it, it, it like helped me feel, you know, like I was like, we we're leading up to, to, to what the ending was and yeah. There's like blood, passion, I don't know. Yeah, no, definitely. I think at some point we also, because of the dogs and the wolves, we started talking about like Little Red Riding Hood and yeah, we were definitely, yeah, no, our, our costume designer, that was a big conversation was like how Marion sort of brings the red into Vivian's world or like Vivian had sort of put away the red and then it comes out again when right. Marion shows up. Um, and then those two things eventually kind of crisscross and bleed into one another. Hey. <laughs> oh <my God>. um, <laughs> something I was curious about because a lot of short films are more proof of concept and then it becomes like a more faithful retelling of that in a feature length. This was sort of like more proof of character and obviously not the same exact story. So what was behind the decision to keep the same title? We thought about other titles at the end, uh, sort of like while we were editing, but I don't know. We are, I, I felt like it still really applied. And I think Ani and Ali, they backed me up on that. Um, Cause it was sort of like, it, it, like what the feature became was in some ways sort of the inverse of the short. Like the short was sort of about growing pains and like in the end this feeling that the sisters might sort of be going their own going on their own paths for a while and like it was sort of about the tension between these power dynamics so superior in that sense sort of to me like spoke to some of those themes and those feelings but in the future it's really like sort of more about um the realization that these sisters are like stronger together than apart and that is you know in that way they're sort of like superior or stronger it's a very strong word it's a very loaded word um yeah we also had some backstory with the place superior wisconsin which is just like a little anecdote um i had i'm from minnesota and like when i wrote the short i was sort of obsessed with this town that's on um on Lake Superior in Northern Wisconsin. So I actually wanted to, originally wanted to film the short there. And then because it was kind of crazy to like try to bring everybody from New York to Wisconsin, ended up location scouting upstate and finding similar towns. But then when I met Ani and Ali, it turns out their family, their, you guys can tell, they, your Cuban family lived in Superior. Yeah, so my grandparents, um lived in superior um and my my dad grew up there for a few years and it's like a, a very very tiny town so the chances of that happening are it was a strange small. connection yeah so yeah. i think we all just felt kind of like that also was in the sort of in the background of the title there's like a certain natural competition bet between siblings and and like you said like they we end up realizing that we're the, the, the strongest when we're together but there's like um, there's there's something especially in the feature to me that like you know we've we've grown apart so it's like you know which way of life has like is like you know 
the right way. There's like a, and I think both of them end up um, feeling like they can learn something from each other and in the switching they do. Um, and then maybe find out that neither is really superior and that what they're better to get. Something else that you do that I love is you set this movie in Halloween. And I was reading some of your previous interviews and it, it seems that that was not an easy choice to hold on to because you ran into winter when it was in fact very snowy and cold. So what was it about that setting that, that made you want to go through all that hassle to maintain it? Yeah, it was really important to me. Um, I don't know, I just love Halloween. Like always as a kid, it was just like so big for me and I'm just obsessed with Halloween and like, um, I liked, I think Ali and I also talked a lot when we were writing about like, it's just, I, I just liked, you know, there are a lot of like thrillers or horror movies set around Halloween. I liked the sort of like the interplay that we could kind of create with some of like the horror movie on TV and some of the costumes. And I felt like it added like an interesting echo to what each sister was going through and, and some of the themes we'd already established. and Yeah, just the, the themes of identity too on like the one day of the year where you can kind of be whoever you want to be. Yeah. And then that I think like what really like made Halloween really important to me was when Marion is, is walking home. I mean, Vivian is walking home as, as Marion on Halloween night and she's just like, they're She's seeing like all these little kids also dressed up in costume, but in a way she's also dressed up in a costume. We keep coming back to this theme of identity and it is something that I, I'm really curious, um, Alessandra and Ani, in your, as you're establishing individual careers in a very competitive business while also collaborating with each other, how do you guys find the balance between, you know, like, growing and creating together, but also establishing those individual paths. Yeah, I think it's an ongoing journey. Um, uh, I think that we're kind of figuring it out as we go along. As of now, what's been working is we work on things individually and we work on things together and that's okay. You know, and then we help each other with whatever else we're working on independently if we need another eye on it or whatever, but yeah. I think like with any relationship, you know, you, you can really be the best uh, partner or collaborator when you have the fullness of identity within yourself and um, you have the time and space to find out who you are on your own and then you can both have something to bring to it. I think that's something that in recent times we've, we've been... Um, uh, we've been doing and I see a lot of benefits to that in the work that we come together and are able to do because um, we both have like a, a separate um, fullness. Um, we balance each other out in a lot of ways. We are here at North Bend but we are obviously not here at North Bend. I miss you North Bend. What a lovely place to be and I wish I was there but um you guys, and, and Aaron, you told me before we started, you guys have not actually been at a screening together yet. So what what has your your journey with this film through the festival circuit been like? Are there, so, like, a, is there a surprise pro to having it come out in this virtual circuit or is it all sad? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not all sad. I mean, we premiered at, at Sundance and, um, I think they did a great job with the virtual platform. And I mean, to me, the biggest like silver lining of that was that our families and like friends and other places got to see the premiere. And that was honestly really exciting. And um, I think I've talked to some people since then that just, yeah, like thought it was actually pretty cool that it sort of democratized the festival in a way that like, cause there's so many people who can't afford to go to Sundance or like just wouldn't um you know it's in a, it's kind of a bubble in a lot of ways so I think that was the best thing I was getting to share that experience with um more people but it's been kind of sad <laughs> like 
I don't know. It's weird to not have sat in a theater. Like I've, I've started going to movies again in New York and it's so great. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I really look forward to getting to do that. Um, hopefully with casts and, and some of our crew eventually sitting in an audience together and having that experience. I know you asked about the positive things, but I did, I do feel like it, it, I did really miss out on feeling like we could all celebrate together and like, you know, like hold each other, like just, I, that's like just something from this year that now I'm like, I just, I want contact. Like I just want to be with people and experiencing it in, in the energy together. And so it was sad not to be able to do that. But at the same time we were, you know, uh, it does op open up, like we're, we're all able to be in completely different places on our own journeys and still come together for an hour and be able to talk and, and do the events, you know? Yeah, and I think that when it does happen, it'll, it'll make it sweeter. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, I can only confirm that through finally getting to hang out with like friends and family after 18, you know, however many months of saying we would, but I do think it makes it a little sweeter. And um, you, you hit on something interesting though, Annie, which I hadn't considered, which is that you can be in different places doing like, uh, pursuing projects and still come together in this way. From from my perspective, I agree that it is a bit democratizing and uh, I have never gone to some of the film festivals that I've been able to watch movies at, but I, I appreciate because you did just flag for me a, a positive for the creatives and I had been struggling to think of one. Yeah, no, that's a, I think that's a big plus. And I mean, we have been working on something the three of us in different places. And so we are experiencing that a lot on Zoom. And it would be nice to be in the same room. I hope we have that experience too, but it's, yeah, I do think it has like opened up a different working space actually. That's an interesting thing. I've, I've talked to some people who are perhaps like me really, uh, shy or not so great in a crowded room who really love doing stuff in this format. Have you guys found that it, it forces you to embrace a different side of your creativity now that you're working on a project together through a digital screen? I kind of love it. I mean, I think um, I have collaborators that are in, in different places and it's been really great to be able to like schedule meetings in this time and um, do things over Zoom. Obviously, when we're able to get together in person, that's great. But I find that it it actually like in some ways helps with the focus, at least for me, because it's like, you know, when you're when you're on Zoom, I don't know, something about it feels more like this is the time to work, you know. And I think it's pretty good for writing, actually. Yeah, but like getting more into production, yeah, it would be tricky not to be. Better. I do really like like physical materials and sort of like being able to look at the same things together sometimes like images and even though all of more and more that's sort of like on a screen anyway but um yeah I think it's kind of like it um it just like is makes the, the it expedites the process of everything going virtual for sure and I mean just in a lot of ways the pandemic has has just uh kind of exacerbated what was already happening and just like sent us off in that direction of just everything. I mean, I guess it cuts down some travel time. I have uh, saved many hours of my life in LA not being in traffic. Oh, in LA, that's huge. Yeah. yeah. I have a very goofy question. It, I, it was just on my mind the whole movie. Have you guys ever successfully tricked people and switch places? <laughs> not successfully but we did try <laughs> once in first grade it was successful uh, for a moment um but then we turned ourselves in so we were in first grade and we basic we were in the same classroom we we're in the same homeroom so we just switched desks and then we got like a quiz from the teacher and we like freaked out because we were not sitting at the right desk so we thought like we didn't have a plan for like was she gonna write my name or were they gonna write hers we and also all of our friends could always tell us apart. So even if like we got away with it with the teacher, like I, when push came to shove, like our friends knew that we had switched. So like they were all looking to see what we were gonna do. <laughs> we just- All the people in our assigned area knew that like we had switched. Yeah. 
Uh, so to wrap things up, we do have two questions that we always ask our guests here. And the first one is also kind of goofy, but do you guys have any pets? We actually grew up with a lot of pets. Like when we were younger, we had like snakes and chameleons and like just like a crate, like dogs. Um, we had like sugar gliders at one point, which are like flying squirrels. We had like a lot of exotic pets. Whenever my dad was taking care of us, he would, I mean, like we, it was like an activity. One of the activities we did together, we did, but one of the activities we did together, he would just like, be like, yeah, I think it was like in a, if we were like, you know, he, he didn't know what we were going to do next. He'd be like, let's go to the pet store. Oh my God. Uh, he was just always very adventurous with that. Like, and my poor mom would come home from work and be like, what? <laughs> like, a chameleon now? <laughs> <laughs> um, but right now I don't have any pets, which I'm sad about. I don't either. I love animals. I want a pet so badly, but can't do it. I don't know. Being in New York in a very small apartment. Me and my partner were considering, well, we were just like Googling the other day. They're like these giant rap, giant Flemish rabbits. Oh they're like God. the size of a dog, but they're a rabbit. I think we like, uh, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> but we were, we were just throwing that around the other day. The last question we always like to ask our guests is, um, uh, if anything within the genre, whether it's a, a book or a movie or a show, and whether you want to qualify genre as horror or sci-fi, whatever you love in genre storytelling, what's something you would recommend our listeners go check out after this? I recently rewatched um, The Vanishing, the original. It's a, a Dutch, wait, the filmmaker is um, George Louiser. I don't know if I'm butchering his name, but there's a remake, but the original I think is from the late 80s and it is just the scariest. I think it's like the best thriller ever made. Um, and I just thought of that because I recently rewatched it and it's just 100%. If you're looking for a great thriller, it's a little bit of a slow burn, but like it just totally pays off in the end and it, it's so great. One of my favorite endings of all time, one of my favorite films. And to be very clear, this only applies to the original. Don't go watch the remake. I've been reading Elena Ferrante recently. I'm just like really interested in reading um, like female driven stories that, you know, I guess that the through line between Superior and Elena Ferrante is like there's um, the coming of age of a young woman and through a female perspective, you just like, as, as a woman, it's so, it's just so nice that you feel so like held reading uh, female voices, um, especially with people who are willing to be like as uh, vulnerable and like uh, deal with things as sensitively as, as Elena Ferrante, so. I am mostly watching Sop The Sopranos right now. And I'm also on a bit of a Hall Ashby kick. Yeah, I, I, I love Harold and Maude and, um, being there is really great. That sounds like a really existential duo, The Sopranos and Hal Ash. <laughs> <laughs> much to consider. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for your time. It was such a pleasure. Thank you to North Bend Film Festival for setting this up. If you are attending North Bend Film Festival, definitely check out Superior. I highly recommend it. If you are not, keep an eye out for it because I still highly recommend it. Uh, thank you guys so much. It was such a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise.